Symposium for the Aspen Center for Physics, which this year we're doing in a very unusual um, way because we are all socially isolated, um, et cetera. Amanda and Patty are sitting in the Aspen Center for Physics. And if you guys showed your picture, everyone could feel jealous for what it would be like if we were all there. I don't know if you're there. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but everyone should be able to see, you know, you could be there. Like it is, there are humans there. Amanda and Patty are holding down the fort. Um, anyway, we have this colloquium series and um, um, we're happy to have the first talk this week from Lucy Caldwell from Cambridge University. I will introduce her in a second. I want to point out that this colloquium is happening every week. Um, the different programs that would have run this summer um, nominate speakers who are speaking. Um, there's also a public lecture series um, that is occurring, and this week it is occurring on Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and the speaker is Andre de Govia, who's talking about particle physics, what we know, and we, we, what we know we don't know, that's the title. So I, I encourage you all to come to that as well. So let me now um, introduce Lucy. So this is part of the program that we were going to run this summer, which was called Data-Driven Discovery in Biology. The idea of the program was to bring together people who were interested in thinking about new ways of taking advantage of the huge data sources that have become available to think about biology and really make mechanistic models from them um, in ways of helping. We were going to have um, on site um, people who were experts in image analysis. So for example, one of the people, um, it was named was Viren Jain, who is a research scientist at Google who works on using large sets of images to reconstruct neural connectomics. That was sort of on one side. And then the other side, I think, is represented by Lucy, who is about to speak, who's going to talk about learning from sequence data. Um, and um, so, um, anyway, Lucy, um, um, maybe you should take over now. That was my intro. Okay, so I also need to uh, take over as host, I think, to present. Um, I'm delighted to be here, everybody. Um, Michael didn't say much about me in that intro, which is great, but um, I work on trying to build models for large sets of biochemical data, both sequences and also small molecules. I'm actually in the chemistry department at Cambridge, um, although I was trained as a, as a mathematician. Um, and so I feel like I'm sort of converging on, on being a physicist. I'm getting there slowly but surely. Um, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about some of the projects that I've been working on and that other people have been working on um, over the last several years. And I'm gonna try and uh, make this as accessible as possible. And there is a good amount of time for a discussion afterwards. And so I really hope that people will ask lots of questions. Uh, I think there are some interesting advances that have been made in this area recently, and I'd love to communicate that. So I'm really interested in building models for proteins. I will specifically talk about the deep learning models that we've been building more recently. I'm gonna start off by talking about some other models that, that I and others have built um, that I think are particularly interesting for a physics audience. And so this graphic is just illustrating a, a schematic whereby we make changes to sequences. These little objects here are protein sequences. I'm imagining making changes to them systematically. We can design new versions and then testing those in the lab and then using that data to really build a mapping between protein sequence or some kind of representation of protein sequence and whatever functional activity we're interested in and what we'd really like to be able to do is walk in this landscape. So be able to explore this landscape and find new protein sequences with really interesting properties. And this is you know, very basic introduction. Everyone will remember that proteins are made as polypeptide chains of amino acids. There are 20 natural amino acids. These are, these are a few of them shown here, phenylalanine, leucine, serine, cysteine. They have different physical and chemical properties. Um, and they're synthesized as a polypeptide chain, which then, of course, folds up largely spontaneously into a specific, or often into a specific 3D configuration. Now, there are proteins of all kinds. There are proteins that never really assume a specific 3D configuration. They're structurally disordered. They flop around all over the place. There are proteins that are very highly ordered. There are proteins that form large complexes. There's lots and lots of different um, types of proteins. And also, this is often spontaneous, this process, but 
often also biology developed sort of helpers there are chaperone proteins that might be necessary for some proteins to fall there's lots and lots and lots of cases this is always the case in biology there's, there's, there's lots of exceptions it's complicated but roughly speaking this is what happens and the reason that I think this is a particularly exciting time is because of the huge amount of data that we have access to. So this is a plot from the EBI in Cambridge that I grabbed um, earlier today. And essentially it's showing the growth of sequences in the database. This is assembled and annotated sequence growth over time. And you can see that this is a log scale on the y-axis on the left-hand side here, the number of sequences. At the moment, there's millions and millions of billions of sequences that are available. Um, for us to learn from. And I think the key question that we need to answer is how can we really exploit this wealth of data? So one area in which there's been a lot of advances in recent years is building models from protein sequence family alignments, and in particular, being able to predict the 3D structure of proteins from these sets of sequences. Many of you might've heard of AlphaFold, which was a model built by DeepMind that made a huge amount of progress in the recent CASP 2019 structure prediction competition. And I'm gonna explain some of the sort of advances that underlie that progress. And so here I'm showing you just a set of sequences. This is a set of closely related sequences. It's actually part of the hemoglobin sequences from a bunch of different species. And what I'm trying to sort of highlight in these two boxes are places where those sequences change in a correlative fashion. So I'm looking at two particular columns with this alignment. Uh, this is something like column 77 and column 87. So these columns are far apart in the sequence, and yet there's some kind of correlation happening here between the amino acids that are present at each of those positions. And this is an old observation. People made this observation a long time ago, back in the 70s, essentially. And they had this idea that perhaps if we think about the 3D structure of a protein, in particular amino acids that are closely packed against each other, then if one of those amino acids was to change randomly just because of evolution, if that interaction is particularly important for the structure or function of the protein, then that might cause a loss of function mutant. So in this case, this uh, aspartic acid here, this D has changed. It's changed to an arginine, and that happened to change the charge of that amino acid. So what was a nice charge pair holding that protein, potentially holding that protein together, has been lost. Now there are two positive charges, and so this protein has fallen apart, stop working. What can happen is that you get a rescue mutation. You get a second compensatory mutation at a different site. So in this case, this lysine, this positive charge, has flipped and become an aspartic acid and rescued that, that protein. So you've got a functional double mutant. And of course, in nature, if we look at the sequence record, we're never going to see this loss of function mutant. It's inactive. It doesn't work. What we're going to see is either the original, the wild type, or the double mutant. So if we look across our sequence alignment, we're either going to see just the original KD pair or this RD pair. We're never going to see this intermediate. And of course, what that means is that we'll see a correlation in this alignment. And I've just made a little toy alignment here to show that exact happening, but you'll see that here we either see K and D in these two positions or R and D. We never see that, that intermediate. And of course, what we'd like to be able to do is look at these alignments of, of protein sequences and just be able to look identify these correlations, it's much easier than sort of, you know, studying the protein in the lab and be able to make an inference about those two amino acids being important for the structure or function of the protein. So we could do that, for example, by measuring the mutual information for every pair of columns in this alignment. This is a totally simple exercise. And what we might expect to see is some kind of strong signal between these two positions, six and one. So this is just a matrix of all the mutual information values. And we'd like to make the inference that those high scoring pairs are perhaps close in 3D structure or really important for the function of the protein. So let's try that. This is a very simple example where I've taken a large alignment of RAS sequences and I've calculated the mutual information. I've shown the highest scoring pairs in red. So these red pairs are the highest scoring um, mutual information pairs, the top 500 values. And underneath, I'm showing the contact map of the protein structure. So this is the answer. This is those amino acid pairs or sequence position pairs that are close in 3D structure. And what we're hoping is that the red will line up with the blue. And of course, what this shows is that it's, it's not working. This simple approach doesn't work. And there's a number of reasons that, that might be the case. And I wanted to talk about one of those reasons in a bit more detail. 
So can you take a question? Yep, sure. Okay. So can can the two just transpose? You you gave K D and R D, but what about just the flipping of the uh, K and the D? Is there a reason why that isn't part of the Oh no, that, that would absolutely be part. So this correlation is going to be taken over all possible pairs. So if this was uh, K and D here, that would also work just fine. Um, so I'm calculating this correlation here over all possible amino acid pairs. I'm going to count all of the pairs. And what I'm really looking for is just that they change at the same point in the sequence alignment. Does that make sense? Yes. So thanks. yeah, it's, it's just that correlation signal. Uh, but there, that's a good point. It's not at all specific to that particular change. But what we do have in this data, and actually this is true in many, many types of biological uh, data that's being acquired in high throughput, is that there's a bunch of structure. These sequences are not IID, right? They're not drawn randomly um, at uniform from some kind of underlying distribution. There's a bunch of structure, and that structure is caused by evolutionary history and how we've sampled the sequences. And so in this case, I'm just showing that there are two sort of major groups in this alignment, which I've colored, one of which is, is, is primates and the other of which is sort of more distant species. And actually, as it happens, that, that correlation I called out to you, that really follows that uh, species division, right? Because we know that you know, primate sequences are more similar to each other um, than these other more exotic species. And so more generally, you know, we've all seen these phylogenetic trees that show us a structure in sequence alignment and we sort of have this large amount of structure in the data. There's nothing to do with structure or function. And we need to figure out, you know, is that uh, confounding the signal that we're looking for? Well, how can we answer that question? I can just make a really simple model. This model is going to look very familiar to lots of physicists. Essentially, I'm simulating a model where I put some pairwise couplings in, um, and I've used the, the contact map, the structure of a protein, to give me those pairwise couplings. And so what I want to ask is if I simulate data from this model, can I recover this, this, this contact map, right? This is a purely sort of toy data set, but you know, I'm just gonna ask if, I, if, I, if, if my, my whole hypothesis is true, then this should work, right? And in particular, I'm gonna test it both with phylogeny, so with this confounding structure in my simulation, and without. So I'm confident in the case without that I should be able to recover these pairwise interactions, but I'm more worried about the case with phylogeny. And indeed, it turns out that in the case with phylogeny, it's much more difficult for me to recover the pairwise, these EIJ coupling terms, just by looking at the correlations in the resulting data from the simulation. On the other hand, without phylogeny, I actually do a pretty good job, right? I'm able to recover these pairs, pairwise couplings fairly accurately. Um, and, and so that you know, sort of makes things encouraging that perhaps I've discovered um, some source of, of a confounding uh, sort of noise in, in, in the real data that I'm working with. So that raises the question, how can I get rid of this phylogenetic uh, confoundment? Well, again, I can sort of make a simple model. I'm going to start with the very simplest phylogeny, which I just have two branches, uh, X1 and X2. is a very simple sort of structure in my data. And if I think carefully about this, I can actually write down the sample covariance matrix that this structure will produce. Right? It's basically going to have these off-diagonal terms, these alpha terms. Where I'm defining alpha here. And basically, this is just the covariance of the sequences that occurs due to this shared structure early on, right? So if we think about, you know, these branch lengths getting really, really long, then the sequences will forget about that sort of shared structure, that shared evolutionary history, and it'll dilute out and alpha will go to zero. On the other hand, if the branches are very short and the sequences are really influenced by the shared history, then alpha will be close to one. Of course, I can solve for the eigenvalues of that matrix, and I find that they're one plus or minus alpha, if I move to a more complicated tree, in this case, I've just added another layer of branching, I start to see that there's regularity to how this sample covariance matrix forms. And I end up, if I make this matrix larger and larger, just finding more and more sort of blocks with powers of alpha, this one parameter that controls everything. And it turns out I can actually solve for the eigenvalues of that matrix no matter how large I make it. And what I find is that the resulting eigenvalues a Bayer power law, um, and I can write that power law very simply in terms of, uh, again, my parameter alpha. So that's like a nice sort of hypothesis that these sequences might be um, subject to this phylogenetic noise and that the noise might cause covariance that obeys a power law. It turns out actually that um, that really 
matches very nicely with simulated data. And I don't think I put this slide in, but it actually also uh, matches what happens if you look at real uh, protein sequence alignments. So if you uh, form a covariance matrix and look at the eigenvalues, we find that they fall on the power law exactly like the one that I'm showing here from the simulated data. And moreover, it turns out that if you then, uh, the large eigenvalues here are really those caused by phylogeny. Um, if I sort of repeat this without phylogeny, you'll see that the, uh, there, there isn't this power law in the data. And what we then find is that if we remove these large eigenvalues from the covariance matrix, then actually we can really do a much better job of predicting contacts um, and the precision goes right up uh, if we just uh, take away those large eigenvalues caused by phylogeny. So that's sort of a nice result. It ends up, you know, this is, I'm showing you again, this, this comparison with data. If I use mutual information, I do a really bad job of finding these uh, contacts in 3D structure. If I use uh, this, uh, an, an approach that involves getting rid of these large eigenvalues, here I'm actually inversing the covariance matrix, which has the effect of really um, downweighting those large eigenvalues and getting, sort of getting rid of those confounding uh, correlations caused by phylogeny. And I'm able to do a much better job of identifying these contacts. And it turns out that that actually provides enough information from those sequence alignments to be able to fold up the protein and find the 3D structure. Um, so there's been a lot of work done in the community um, exploiting this advance, which was made a few years ago, and most recently uh, this, this, this alpha fold, um, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this bar, but alpha fold, this deep neural network approach, which is, which is quite something, which includes these um, 2D covariation features that come out of this analysis, really show that you're, they're able to even make predictions for um, proteins, the, three, the 3D structure of proteins where there are comparatively few sequences available so they can kind of transfer to new proteins using these deep neural networks. And um, this was sort of an, a, a really exciting advance. But the problem here is that these approaches depend on sequence alignment and it does limit their ability to really extrapolate to new protein families. So if I give you a protein family that hasn't, hasn't been seen before, um, then it's, it's difficult to build this, this kind of model unless you can find lots of other sequences that, that are homologous that are already available in the natural database. So this sort of sequence alignment um, approach has, has been around in the literature for, you know, a, what if I'd say 30 or 40 years at least. Um, and it sort of raises the question of whether this is the best way of comparing sequences to each other. Right? What we really want to know is how similar different sequences are, how different they are, and we have this one way of doing it. And now that you know, we're sort of, people are building all of these deep learning models, it raises the question of whether there might be other ways of approaching sequence similarity. So what I want to show you are some models that we've built recently um, that are able to annotate protein sequences, I'd say more accurately than state-of-the-art methods. And in particular, when we put them, sort of combine them with state-of-the-art methods, we're able to exceed the accuracy of either method individually. Um, so just to motivate this slightly, um, the community really needs better tools to annotate all of that protein sequence data that I mentioned earlier. We have billions of sequences, but there's actually significant proportions of those sequences. In this case, the authors of this Nature article are talking about a third of all protein, co protein coding genes from bacterial genomes simply cannot be annotated with a function. So we have all of this data, we're collecting all this data, it, you know, it's expensive, it's not cheap, and yet we don't actually know what it means. We need to be able to label these sequences in order to better understand what they can be used for. So this was a very impressive paper that came out a couple of years ago where they used a very sort of intensive experimental approach to label a bunch of new sequences. Um, they did a huge amount, amount of experimental work and they were able to label some new sequences but it, it, you know, it's not really high throughput. If we're thinking about a third of all of those billions of sequences, we really need new computational approaches that can scale in addition to this kind of experimental work. And so we said as a starting point, why don't we take a really well studied data set where people have put a lot of work into curating the data and ask if we can build deep learning models that can simply annotate this data. So we started with this data set PFAM, um, which is actually the full version of PFAM is largely constructed using hidden Markov models, but we were interested in the seeds. This is about 1.3 million sequences that are largely human verified 
where the members are chosen as kind of exemplars of different families. And so we wanted to ask is if we take all of this data, can we build a model where we put in protein sequences and our deep learning model can somehow classify the sequences according to which class they belong to. And key to this is that we're not gonna put in aligned sequences. So we're trying to sort of move past this alignment uh, approach and just ask if we can take unaligned data and learn directly from the raw data. And this is just showing some statistics of the data set. Um, there are a lot of small families, essentially. So this is showing the number of families with uh, very few sequences. There's almost you know, sort of thousands and thousands of families that have less than 20 sequences. So it's, it's pretty long tailed. Um, and we also have sequences of all lengths up to roughly up to 2000 in the seeds. And so we built uh, a CNN, a convolutional neural network to tackle this problem. It actually is a, it's a dilated convolutional neural network, which means that there are sort of holes in the, in the windows that we look over. Um, and we actually built a bunch of different models to try and understand uh, you know, what types of models would work best. We've also built, built a number of RNNs, um, recurrent neural networks. We found that those were much, in our hands anyway, much less stable to train, but I'm sure that other people can, can do better. Um, what was interesting is that these models learn a fixed length representation of each protein sequence. So this is called an embedding. So every sequence, regardless of length, gets converted by the model to this fixed length representation. And actually, our model can handle sequences of any length. So there's one protein sequence that's something like 33,000 amino acids long, and that goes into the model just fine. Um, so but this, this, this embedding is something that I'll talk about later, this representation that we learn. Um, and actually, it turns out that we had to work quite hard to beat the existing approaches on this data set, but we did manage to beat them. Um, we have significantly fewer errors than, than existing approaches. Um, but what I think is, is most interesting about this is that our approach really is learning something different to the existing approaches. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, it's reassuring our model, if we look at the cosine similarity uh, in the embedding space between amino acids, our model learns the known uh, similarity matrix that's been sort of built from evolutionary data. So these matrices have very similar structures. On the right hand side, this is the Blossom 62 matrix, which is built from uh, known sequences. And on the left hand side is the similarity learned by our model. And you know, of course, there are some differences, it's not identical, um, but it does have a very similar structure. Uh, we also, we made a clustered trained test split. So we wanted to ask if our model could label sequences that were highly distinct from the sequences it was trained on. And we found that we could also do very well um, for those sequences. This is showing performance as a function of distance from the training data. So here, these sequences are at most 10% identical to the training sequences. And these on the right hand side are at most 25% identical. So these sequences are all quite different from the training data, and yet we're able to accurately classify this. So our blue line here has a lower error rate than the other models. I think it is um, very important to do a careful comparison against existing models because um, it's, it's easy to think that you know, a deep learning model, just because it's, it's new, um, sort of does better. Um, and uh, you know, I want to emphasize that it was quite difficult to beat the existing alignment-based approaches. And what we found that I think was most interesting is that if we put our approach, which we call PROT, this is an ensemble neural network, where we had to ensemble a bunch of CNNs, um, together with the existing HMM, then, which is this bar here on the right hand side, then the performance actually exceeds the performance of either model individually. And that's because they're actually, as far as we can tell, learning something quite distinct. And so we like this idea that, that the deep learning provides complementary information to existing methods. And so it meant that we were able to go back to the database we were working with and propose adding uh, a significant amount of data to that database. So this is showing PFAM, um, the size of PFAM over time as they add new sequences, the different versions uh, that are released over the years. And if we were to add all of our proposed sequences to the, to the version 32, then that would result in something like three or four million sequence domains being added. So that was exciting. It seemed like we actually did something that would potentially contribute to that database. I talked a bit about that learned representation of sequence space. So this is showing a uh, simple principal component analysis of that uh, length 1100 vector. And we find that you know, proteins from the same families are grouped together in this embedding space. 
and it allows us to sort of, if we take a sequence that we don't know the label for, we can use proximity in this learned embedding space to classify that sequence. Um, so there's a lot of uh, things that we would like to try with this learned embedding space. And I sort of going back to that phylogenetic structure that presumably is captured in this data too, I'd like to understand how, how that's reflected uh, by the deep learning model, uh, which also must have learned something about phylogeny. Um, so I sort of, you know, I talked about um, building these deep learning models and I talked earlier at the start of the talk about being able to sort of uh, find new protein sequences. Um, we really like to be able to do this by leveraging that learned embedding space. Um, I don't know if that's possible yet, but essentially what we're hoping is that we can use machine learning to really move through the sequence space more rapidly and take larger steps um, and manage the, the trade-off between building better models, so exploring the landscape and, and exploiting to, to the model that we have so far to, to find the best sequences. Um, so I want to talk briefly in the last few minutes about an experimental application where we've, we've tried this out together with some collaborators um, uh, at, at Harvard. And this was in the context of trying to identify diverse capsids for use in AAV gene therapy. So this is a picture of an AAV protein capsid. It's a very large uh, structure made out of 60 monomers. Um, it's about 25 nanometers across. You can see it's also very complex. The surface is, is, it has a lot of features. Um, it has beautiful symmetry, this capsid. Um, you can sort of see that if, if you look carefully. Um, but as I say, it's made out of 60 monomers and each monomer is 735 amino acids. So it's really a large object. Now, adeno-associated virus-based gene therapy has uh, both EU and FDA approvals. Uh, but in order to actually make this work, at scale, uh, there, there are a number of sort of blocking points, one of which is that we need diverse versions of the protein capsids, both so that we can avoid the natural immunity that people have, so that people's immune systems don't destroy the therapy, and it would also be great to be able to target specific tissue types to make the, the therapy addressable. So we carried out um, a, a large study, essentially, in which uh, we made lots of variants, we sort of designed and made lots of variants of the, the, the capsid protein, the 735 amino acid protein. And this is just a, a, a nice diagram by one of my collaborators showing the experimental workflow by which we can compare uh, the number of each variant sequence in an initial library and the number of each variant sequence that survives a round of uh, viral replication uh, in the final library. So we're gonna be measuring selection, which is the ratio of these two library sizes where these are all normalized by the wild type sequence. And there's a fair amount of noise in this assay. I'm just showing some of the, the data here. Um, all of these green sequences basically should have the same value, zero. So there's a fair amount of spread. And so we decided that essentially from this data, we could either tell whether each sequence variant worked or was broken. That's like one bit of information, which is a little bit conservative. Maybe we could have said that some were better than wild type, but we decided just to be safe and, and binarize the labels. So what we wanted to do was to take a bunch of training data and we didn't know what training data to use. So we just had three different training data sets. We built three different types of models. We had a, legit, a legitimate regression of very simple baseline model. And then we had two neural network models that were more complex. Um, and we trained each type of model on each uh, training set. And so we ended up with nine models to compare. We're really, literally just trying to figure out how to do this. The training set, some of them, the, the smallest one was sequences very close to the starting sequence. So we had all single mutants and some randomly chosen double mutants. And then we had a sort of medium sized set and a larger set where we, uh, our collaborators designed the sequences to enrich the number of positives. Um, and essentially we, you know, we had to pick sequences to, to test using these models. Um, sequence space is huge. And so we needed a starting point. And so we picked something like, I think it's actually 2.5 billion random sequences around wild type. And then we ranked them using each of these nine model training set combinations in order to find the sequences that each model preferred. So this was like a sort of a huge exercise in some sense, just to pick a bunch of, or find a bunch of candidates that the models really liked. And we wanted to pick candidates that, you know, covered a good amount of distance around the wild type sequence so we could understand, you know, how far we could walk in this space. 
And then once we had candidates that each model liked, we wanted to try out the strategy of really following the model gradients to improve the sequences. And so we, we did that, we allowed you know, 20 steps for each sequence and we, we literally walked them, these are discrete, and so we can just take discrete steps and do rounds of greedy optimization um, following the model gradients. That's all sort of very complicated, but what we found actually, this is a figure showing the results for our RNM model. We found that we were able to accurately design sequences of precision. This is saying out of all the sequences we tested, how, what, what percentage were viable. Um, this is a, shown in dotted lines here is an additive baseline model. Uh, so this is just where we take the single site mutations and add up uh, the sequence, the, the, the experimental results in order to predict what happens for a multi-mutant. But what we were able to show is that using our machine learning models, actually irrespective, it seems almost, of how many sequences or what data set they were trained on, we were able to greatly increase the precision, particularly for sequences that were more distant from the wild type starting sequence. So here we have something like 50 or 20 changes to that starting sequence, and yet we're still able to design sequences with uh, at least 50% precision. Um, uh, and you know, the, the security, the middle tra size training set in this case, reduced the model that had the best sequences. I suspect that if we were to do this again, the, the results, you know, these three lines could equally sort of change position. Um, I think it just kind of depends um, what sequences you start with and how you start out walking. Um, but what we also found, we tried to quantify the diversity of the sequences defined by different models. And we found that this is our additive baseline again in gray. This is a plot showing um, the number of clusters of viable sequences. And we just cluster based on similarity. Uh, and this is for clusters of different size. You can imagine you have this set of sequences and you're kind of tiling the surface with clusters. Um, but we found that the neural networks were able to design more diverse sequences than our simple logistic regression model. And that seemed to hold true for uh, all of the um, training sets, although we only had three. So this was um, an exciting study. We certainly didn't believe this would be true when we, start, when we started out. We thought that it might be much more difficult to find sort of viable sequences that were far away from wild type, and that's what the additive model suggested. Um, but somehow our machine learning models were able to, to do a good job. Um, we tested something like uh, 180,000 sequence variants overall. Uh, and so, you know, we, we had a good amount of data. Um, you know, it's not the case that we just had a, a few sort of mutants that were far from Malta. We did have a lot. Um, and so I was, I was sort of really excited by that. And we're currently working on a number of different application areas. So I think I've um, described hopefully what is uh, sort of an interesting set of work in a field that might be quite different from the fields that people are listening to study. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. I think that there's a lot of potential in this area to um, really do a better job of exploiting all the data that we're collecting and um, also using that data to learn models with which we can design new sequences. Um, but yeah, if there's anything I can clarify, please feel free to ask. Okay, great. Thanks, Lucy. That was excellent. So now um, people can ask questions. And I guess um, maybe we should try. There are lots of people here, but maybe. Um, so, Miko, why don't you go? Mirko, um, you just raised your hand. Uh, yes, uh, th thank you very much. I, I have a, a few questions. So, in, in the initial part of your talk, you talked about building a model from protein sequence alignment to mm -hmm. structure prediction. So <clears throat> I'm just wondering, um, protein function is also really important. So can you infer from this initial model what the protein functions will be? Because essentially that's the ultimate goal of this field. Yeah, no, I think this is really important. Um, and you know, the, the, that's part of the reason that I think it's important to explore lots of different approaches. So the annotation work that I was talking about with the, the deep um, models is very much about trying to be able to try and label sequences or predict the function of a protein sequence. Um, it's difficult, you know, it's really difficult to, to sort of, given a new sequence, be able to, to predict something about its function, being able to predict something about its structure or the other proteins that it's closely related to does help. Um, but yeah, no, I think the, the function question is, is paramount. Um, and I think that that's really what I'm personally working on at the moment. 
Um, so I'm interested in being able to predict the function of sequences in you know, that, that don't have sort of family labels, but also within a family, can we predict which sequences are better or worse? Um, so I think there's sort of two levels of that question that are interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so Ali, you're the next question. Hi, Lucy. Uh, great talk. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I had a question on your AAV capsid work. You, you uh -huh. quantified diversity in clustering in the previous slide. Could you just give some yeah. details on how you quantified that? Sure. So basically, um, we used a very simple greedy approach um, where essentially we you know, picked the furthest sequence from wild type to start with. Um, we then used uh, Levenstein edit distance to define uh, the radii. Of radius of the cluster and so you know we simply pick the further sequence to all sequences within that radius um, and put them in that cluster and then picked a, a, a next sort of the next closest sequence to wild type remaining and built a cluster around it so these clusters can overlap if that makes sense because you know sort of the the, the radius and the diameter are different um, but basically we're just using Levenstein edit, edit distance does that make sense yes thank you cool okay so, Dennis, you have the next question. Uh, great, yeah, thank you for the talk. It's Dennis Salacuate here. Uh, we have been working for the last two years on the AlphaFold model and published an um, open source version of it. And one thing uh -huh. that we saw when we learned about how to set these networks up and get the best performance, and I think that's also in alignment with the TR Rosetta code from the Baker Lab, is that the auxiliaries that you use in order to get your target function properly predicted is extremely crucial. So I was wondering if you could make some comments about what auxiliaries you use to attribute function better to sequences. Um, that's interesting, Angie. What do you mean by auxiliaries? Can I just ask? Um, so auxiliaries are typically secondary predictions that your neural network mm -hmm. does that you don't mm -hmm. really aim for, but they help the training process to not get stuck into local minima. and. Um, that that seems to really drive uh, accuracy gains a lot right now. That's cool. Um, so for our um, annotation work, um, we didn't actually have any auxiliaries. Um, you know, there are sort of other, um, there is other information that we can get out of our network, but we didn't use any of that in the training process. Um, so I guess, you know, it raises an interesting question of whether we could further improve the accuracy of our models by by adding in um, some additional prediction tasks. I guess, are you talking about being able to predict, for example, secondary structure? Or, yeah, for, um, for example, the five psi angles, that's what Alpha Fold did um, yeah. for their predictions. Yeah. When you look at the TR Rosetta code for protein structure prediction, they were more thinking about completely different um, auxiliary angles between far mm -hmm. distant side chains. And I would assume that there are similar features that you could derive from the sequence space as well and use inside of your training procedure. Yeah, I mean, so we very much wanted to just use the, the unaligned sequences and, and, and the family labels. Um, I, I, you know, I sort of worry slightly that, that by including in more information, um, you know, we'd be kind of um, potentially requiring more features of a new sequence to be able to classify it. But, um, you know, I, that, that, it's a really interesting idea. Um, and, 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 you know, we, sh we should explore it. So thanks for the suggestion. That's interesting. Okay, so Rui, you have the next question. Uh, I have two questions, kind of naive questions. Uh, first of all, uh, you, according to your talk, it seems like uh, you're, you're saying basically DL uh, method is uh, kind of better, work a little better than traditional method in uh, some cases. Do you see that mm -hmm. long, long term uh, wise, uh, do you see the DL method will dominate the traditional method? like? Just like uh, in the Go game, like everybody is like uh, using, yeah, it's way better than that. Another question I have is, uh, you, you seem like you're talking about super all the cases are supervised learning. Have you ever think about like maybe unsupervised learning, without mm -hmm. creating anything, uh, just let the machine find out something by itself? Thank you. Sure. Um. So I have no idea, honestly, if deep learning is gonna become um, really prevalent in this space. I think it's a very interesting question at the moment whether we can train useful models and exploit some of these technologies. Um. I, you know, I'm I'm keen to find out. Um. But you know, the, the existing approaches are strong. Um. And I and I think that you know, honestly, I just want to sort of solve the problem and be able to label more sequences so that we can you know get more information out of this data and better understand proteins. Um, in terms of um, your second question, um, 
Actually, can you just remind me, Rui, of your second question? Sorry. Oh, I, I'm asking about uh, whether you can you try unsuper unsupervised learning. Oh, yeah. So I think, I mean, certainly the, you know, the sort of PCA plot I showed of, embed of the sort of embeddings learned by the model, you know, that seems like a sort of place that's potentially ripe for unsupervised learning. Um, you know, just sort of clustering sequences um, would require some kind of similarity metric, I guess. I think this, you know, this is interesting. Um, we found the supervision to be really useful so far, um, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's like a, there's a lot of stuff to be done, basically. So I, I don't have a coherent, succinct comment to make about that, other than like people should try stuff in this domain, essentially. Thank you. There's a lot of things to do. Thanks. So the next question is Claire. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, this is way out of my field of expertise, but I was wondering at the very beginning of your talk when you were, you sort of had like an icing model in a field with um, um, Boltzmann weight. And I was just wondering in order to find the, you know, the parameters, the couplings and stuff, did you use maximum entropy? Yes, basically. Um, that's a, that's a good question. There's a bunch of work that a lot of people have done on how to sort of best find these fields and couplings. Um, and yeah, maximum entropy sort of approaches related to maximum entropy have, have it seems to have been very powerful um, in trying to sort of identify the, the model from the data. Um, I guess that, that sort of DCA approach that I was talking about is going back to the previous question, uh, was largely unsupervised in the sense that you know you're, you're just using a model a sort of set of examples to to parameterize a model rather than um, using labels um, so that that might sort of be relevant to that previous question um, but yeah yeah we're using a maximum people tend to use maximum entropy approaches yeah thank you things I should have said that the next question so Den Dennis made a comment actually as you were I'm following both comments and questions. Maybe we'll go to questions, hands raised first, and then we'll go back to comments at the end, just to be fair. So Michael Levy is the next question. Uh, hey, um, I was wondering if your, the evolutionary exploration you did told you anything interesting or unexpected about the landscapes. That's a great question. We were quite, I was quite surprised. So I didn't show much data about that. Some of the models really, found like a ridge, I would say, in sequence space and kind of walked along it in a very sort of determined way. So one of the logistic regression models in particular, it just like found this sequence that it really liked and it tried to progressively make every starting sequence look like that sequence. It like just systematically replaced every residue that they sort of had with, you know, it, it made them more and more like a sequence. It was like very single-minded. And as a result, the sequences it designed weren't very diverse. <laughs> they literally like all came from that, what seemed to be a ridge, but it was extremely successful. It was our most successful model in terms of precision. Like it could very accurately design sequences as far as something like 25 steps from wild type, um, which none of the other models could, could match. Um, you know, it, it, other logistic regression models took different routes. It really seemed to be that somehow the models would um, sort of, you know, they, they, it, what happened early on affected where they ended up. Um, so, you know, this landscape is obviously very high dimensional and I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface of exploring it, essentially. So just generating data on these landscapes, I think is valuable at the moment because if we really want to understand anything about the relationship between sequence and function, you know, we need to know what these landscapes look like, um, in particular away from wild type sequences. So the field has done a very comprehensive job in recent years of characterizing sequences close to wild type via deep mutational scanning data sets. They tend to look sort of one or two steps from wild type, but um, further out, I feel like we know much less about what these landscapes look like. You know, how rugged are they? Like, do there tend to be sort of peaks that are far from wild type that are, you have to cross valleys to get to? Um, you know, there's so many unanswered questions um, that just in terms of what the landscapes look like, um, that I think there's a bunch of work to be done and you know how best to build models for these landscapes obviously depends on your your goal your objective like you could imagine if you want to just find distant peaks from wild type then you need a much sort of less precise model perhaps than if you want to kind of you know really um explore a particular area of sequence space or i can just imagine there being different use cases um and, and needing different models i mean in this case you know we binarized everything so we were just looking for areas that were equally high as land as, as wild type um, and, and that 
that I, you know, I honestly didn't expect to see these results where we could walk quite as far as we did. Um, uh, also, yeah. you, on your, you had a slide that where you showed uh -huh. the error going down as your evolutionary distance went up. Does that make that is opposite of what oh. I would expect? Is that that was for the class that was for the classification work where we were annotating sequences? Is that right? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I, I, I did a bad job of explaining that. So that was just showing how the models perform as a distance from the training set. And it's confusing because distance is measured in percent identity. So here you're really close to the training set and here you're further away. And okay. you know, you error is higher when you're far away. Yeah, sorry. It's okay. like I, I sort of, yeah, I try to add like the bad and good, but I should also add like far and close or something. Cause yeah, but thanks. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So the next question I think is from Louisa. Yes. Hi Lucy. Um, I just have a question. So it, this is quite far from my field, um, but I also work on explainable AI. So I was wondering whether you're planning to push forward on understanding those embeddings that you were showing um, yeah. and if understanding what they represent and what the algorithm is actually learning can help you maybe construct new models or maybe. Yeah, no, I think this is really interesting um, in particular because we, we want to, you know, sort of learn models, uh, we, want, we want our models to tell us where in the sequence is causing the annotation, right, or where the, where the model believes is causing the annotation. So we, we actually have been working on a bunch of different attribution approaches um, we, we found that there's, you know, there's, there's lots of attribution approaches you can take. Um, there's one which is sort of called, known as CAM in the literature that, that we found works quite well. Um, we also worked with an approach called sufficient input subsets that doesn't require gradients, which is, which is nice. Um, it just sort of, you know, finds the minimal sort of sufficient subset of your input variable. You just literally try deleting stuff. Um, with a sort of backward selection approach um, until you find the minimal uh, input that will reproduce the classification. Um, and so that's been useful. But, uh, you know, the question of what the embedding space means and whether we can learn an embedding space where the structure is useful, I think is really important. And we basically haven't made any progress on that, I would say, uh, but, but we need to. You know, if we want to design new proteins that are useful for, you know, pharmaceutical or biotechnology applications, then be able to understand these embedding spaces you know, figure out what direction to move in if you want to specifically change the function of a protein in a particular way, that would be really powerful. Um, but, you know, those are just uh, ideas, not, unfortunately, we, we can't do that yet. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. So, I think that everybody who raised their hand, there is, there was a, um, if, if I missed it, please raise your hand again because I might be missing it. So, there was a comment in the chat from Rob Kushner who said yeah. even for the I'm trivial here. sequence there, Rob, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I actually, believe it or not, I don't know uh -huh. how to raise my hand. Oh, no, that's good. Okay. But, so, but so you, here you are, so you can that, ask your question. I, sure. Well, I, I couldn't really type very easily either. So uh, let, me, let me just add this. So decades ago, some of us tried making to, sort of toy models mm -hmm. where basically everything was positively charged or negatively charged. In other words, uh -huh. there was no, no sequenced information at all. And we looked at, you know, minimizing some sort of energy, either electrostatic or bending, twisting, uh -huh. something like that. And what was uh -huh. interesting was there were often many local minimal configurations. Uh -huh. It's sort of, a, I'm more of a topologist, math, mathematician right. person than, than a biologist or chemist. But I remember getting some comments back from the chemistry review people at the NSF saying, we don't see much chemistry here. And there was no <laughs> chemistry. The point was, though, that there, there are often many different configurations. And mm -hmm. I think Dennis already started to answer partly the question. But my, my, my question is basically um, understanding how well one can predict shape at all from sequence information and, and how stable. You know, I, there are a whole bunch mm -hmm. of questions one could ask, but sort of how much the sequence is important. And from a more biological pers perspective, whether the sequence Actually, there's some, as you point out at the very beginning, there's some favorability to have sequences that probably have more unique shapes. Because if you have like no sequence information at all, like I called it the trivial sequence mm -hmm. of the question, often there are mm -hmm. many different shapes that are either local minima or even very close to the global minima. There's, 
This is not zero temperatures, so there's chances to fluctuate between shapes. But that's sort of the question, whether one could sort of infer shape from the necessity to have almost unique shapes at the end. I well, and, and I sort of think, I mean, you know, part of the constraints that have to be important because these things need to work in biology is that they need to kind of get pushed into a, a I mean, I don't really know much about protein folding, but when the protein folds, you know, you need it to sort of go reliably to the right structure, right? And so somehow being able to, you know, push it in a way where, you know, it, it sort of gets into a, a trajectory where, it, you know, it ends up at that, that particular structure, I think is, 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 is important. Um, you know, these constraints that we're discovering from evolution are not physics constraints, right? We're discovering these patterns just by looking at these correlations from evolution. I think solving this from a physics perspective, we just look at the sequence and try and build an, an energy model is much more difficult without that evolutionary information, which sort of just learning, you know, what kind of the, the patterns that they're in nature. So I, I don't know how clear I made that, but I think we're still a long ways off being able to, to solve that problem just from physics um, without having that kind of pattern information um, that tells us, you know, it, it, yeah, tells us which amino acids um, you know, are constrained to be close. So Do you mind me that? adding two sentences to this? Yeah. I'm just Dennis here. So uh, one thing that's very important to know is that structure is well more conserved than sequence. So even if you have 60, 70% sequence changes, the three-dimensional structure of proteins that are evolutionary related is still very, very high. So in the CAS-13 experiment two years ago, we were able to get three to four angstrom to the crystal structure that the next typical X-ray experiment would um, get for a given sequence with a complete in silico prediction. Currently, CAS-14 is ongoing, so we'll see end of this year if this improved. Um, the second thing is if you look into the TR Rosetta paper from the Baker Lab that do extensive work in de novo protein design, you can see how they use their pipeline to predict the structure of designed proteins, and that accuracy was even higher since as soon as you use some type of engineering principles to, for example, put some charges in the right positions, it becomes a lot easier to predict the structures. Okay, great. Thank you, Dennis. That was good. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Lucy. So I think we've now, I don't think there's anyone else with their hand raised. Does anybody else want to ask a question before we wrap up? Um, uh, okay, so yeah. oh, yes, the, looking at so the, all, all, all of this is using just sequence data. Could you use structured data? Could you put structured data into your model? Have you thought about doing that at all? Well, so just to be clear, I mean, the alpha fold model, and I think the models that Dennis was talking about, they are supervised with structural yeah. information. Mm -hmm. So kind of making that transition from the unsupervised models that I was talking about, where we, you know, earlier in the talk, where we sort of weren't using structural data, to where you then start using supervision um, in order to try and learn that relationship better. Um, that 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 is kind of a, a, a yeah a big transition, and it means you know yeah you have to start being much more careful about you know when you're making a prediction versus when you're just sort of memorizing what you've seen in the training data. Um, well, I, I have just noticed one. Peter was raising his hand. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you went awfully fast on the part of how I get my machine learning system to not depend on the length of my sequence. Oh, yes. Um, that's true. I didn't explain that in a great deal of detail. Um, essentially, you know, we build uh, a, a, a model that can, you know, take into account, yeah, a sequence of any length. Um, and you know we can, we we're actually we're actually releasing a paper that we hope tries to sort of explain this in a bit of detail because it's not it's not totally clear. But essentially, we have convolutions of lots of different sizes, um, which is basically means that you have these little sliding windows, and you sort of go along the sequence, and then you integrate all of that information from the little sliding windows. And so you know you can sort of just keep going over a sequence just as long as you like, essentially, um, and then just integrate all that information together. That's a very quick explanation. Well, but you get a different number of, okay, okay, so it's all in the integration recipe. Yeah, it's all like how you smush everything together, basically. And there's like a lot of smushing of different kinds, um, the highly technical term. And you say you have a paper on this? 
we we're 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 we have a there is a preprint on this but we have um a preprint that we're still working on we're, we're trying to explain this particular point better with some interactive uh, figures and stuff yeah hmm. thank so you that will be available soon um thank you. so okay so i think that's all if i'm reading zoom correctly here let me just check one more time i think that's all of the questions so i think we should thank lucy for getting us off to a good start on this colloquium series. Um, so everyone should clap. You should practice clapping on Zoom. Um, I also would like to remind you that on Thursday at 5.30 p.m., there is the first public lecture from the Aspen Center for Physics, which will be on particle physics, what do what we know, um, we don't know, by Andre de Guzvia from Northwestern. Um, next week, um, the public, the, this colloquium will continue. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank yeah, thanks everyone for the questions. That was really great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.